hearts. Heavenly Father, we want to come before you now, Lord, because we recognize that uh, whenever we are hearing your word, whenever we are meditating upon your word, we need your Holy Spirit to come and give us the wisdom that we need in order to understand what we are reading, in order to understand what we are hearing, Lord, in order to understand everything that we see every day in our lives. So therefore, I ask at this moment that you will to fill our minds and our hearts, to make us receptive and to make us obedient to your word, Lord. May your children hear you speaking to them the message that you have prepared for each individual this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, um, be before I was called by the South England Conference to uh, work officially, um, you know, in my pastoral duties, I, I worked for five years in uh, the busiest airport in the United Kingdom, and uh, it used to be in Europe as well. Uh, the, the name is not important, so I, I won't say it's Heathrow. Uh, but while working there, um, I, I, I was working with passengers who were having trouble going through the airport, um, with passengers who were less able to travel through the airport, to travel from one plane to the other. So I was meeting different people every day, maybe about 50 to 60 people every day. And, and each one had a different life story. And on this particular day um, that I want to share with you, I, I met a person that was very nicely dressed. Uh, he, was, he was talking nicely. And after a brief conversation, I found out that um, he actually returned from Europe and was going home to Scotland um, after getting a very good deal for his company. He was away on a business trip, and now he was returning home. Um, the, the person was in transit, and when I heard that he's going back home to Scotland, um, I, I remembered all the uh, all the jokes that people say about the, the, the stinginess um, of the Scottish people. Um, and, and, and knowing all those jokes, I, you know, I was very surprised when the man told me that he wants me to take him to the duty free shop. So we went to the duty free. Um, where he further told me that he wants to buy a present for his wife. We met uh, an assistant working there in the duty-free shop, and um, she offered to help us. You know, that was her job. Um, and, and, and the man told her that he, he wants to buy a perfume um, for his wife. The lady went on and showed us a perfume that had a price tag of £60. Pounds. But now I wasn't as surprised as I was earlier because he looked at the girl and, and he said, you know what, 60 pounds is a bit expensive. Show me some, something cheaper. The girl was um, a little bit surprised as well, just like I was. But then she went on to show him a bottle of perfume that was costing around 35 pounds. But the man again replied, it's... It's too expensive for what I have in mind. The girl was now visibly irritated, uh, but it, it, it was her job to help him. So she went over to a bottle costing only 15 pounds. And, and now most of us, you and I, would have bought that 15 pounds uh, bottle of perfume uh, just to avoid being considered, I don't know, stingy or, or, or just to show to others that we respect our spouse. But this passenger was not going to be led into temptation um, of, of, of denying who he really was. So he asked the girl to show him something really cheap. The girl was something that I, um, I had to go back to her afterwards and, and congratulate her for. Because she went, uh, she went away and, and after a few minutes, she returned with a mirror. So the man can see something really cheap. Because you see, if there is one thing that we're afraid of in this life, it's, it's, it's not even death or, or coronavirus or anything. It's actually mirrors. Let, let's be honest, we don't like mirrors because what we see in a mirror is who we really are. 
usually we tend to close our eyes and imagine that we are the brightest, the most beautiful, the most important person in the world. Uh, we, we tell ourselves that uh, we are good, that we are kind, that we are loving, uh, that we are always right. But when we open our eyes and we look in the mirror, what do we actually see? That is who we are. We can use nice words in our everyday speech. We can ask spiritual questions that those around us never heard before and are left amazed. But what do we see when we look in the mirror? Every day we are faced with situations that bring to light who you really are. But, but we think we are so much better than everyone that uh, we, we manage to deceive those around us. And we go in life pretending to be something that we're not. And the moment we have convinced others uh, of, of who we are not, um, we start becoming convinced that we are our alter ego as well. We tell ourselves the same lies. We tell our say, ourselves the same deceiving words and we start believing it. But we can't avoid going home. We can't avoid being by ourselves, and we can't avoid looking in the mirror and seeing the reality. That's the moment of truth, when it's only us and our reflection. That's the moment when we are honest with ourselves, when we don't have to prove anything to anyone else. And, and, and Paul uses a very interesting metaphor about mirrors in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, uh, he says this, For now we see in a mirror dimly. The mirrors that people were using in Paul's times uh, were not the beautiful mirrors that we use today. We're not the mirrors that are, 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 are pre present a, a clear picture of ourselves. Uh, they had the, a shiny metal mirror that would not show a, a very clear reflection. Uh, it would show a dark one. It, it was um, something like if you take a spoon from the kitchen and you will look, uh, you try to look at yourself in that spoon. But then Paul continues to say that there will come a time when we will see the full reflection face to face. Now, of course, uh, Paul was not making a prophecy about the invention of the glass mirror. Um, he wasn't telling the people in Corinth and, and, and asked that one day the, a mirror will be invented that will help the people of Corinth and ourselves see a, a clearer picture of ourselves. But he is emphasizing something else. Verses 8 to 12 in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says this, Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. You see, Paul was engaged in the spiritual formation of the people in Corinth. It's pretty obvious that he's presenting here a metaphor for the knowledge that we have about um, who we are, about what life is all about, um, compared to the understanding of uh, what we will have in the New Jerusalem after Jesus comes for the second time. But the Corinthians read this letter, they read this chapter, they read the metaphor that Paul was using, and, and, and they didn't really 100% get it. Because Paul sees it necessary to repeat the same metaphor, the same idea of looking in a mirror in his second epistle that he to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, uh, Paul says this, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. 
So Paul is not only taking the same metaphor that he used in the first letter that he sent to them, uh, but now he's expanding, he's being more clear about what he meant in the first place. Maybe this time they will get it. It, 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 Paul is emphasizing here that we have to look at the glory of God and let ourselves change in the same image. So that the moment we will look in the mirror, in that moment of truth, when it's only you facing yourself and facing God, we will not see our wretched selves, but we will see Christ being reflected in us. And you see, the, the same Paul is saying in Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Scripture is self-explanatory. And because Paul is the one who throws the idea of looking into a mirror to see the glory of God, he doesn't want to leave us in confusion. So he also recommends, um, let's say, a, a solution for our transformation. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, so uh, looking at what Paul has written in his letters, now we can see that the mirror in which we are to look for the glory of God is the word of God, the Bible. It, it can't be clearer than that. You take the scripture, you read in it, you allow the Holy Spirit to use what you have read to transform you, so that the moment you read from it, uh, the more you read from it, the more you can see yourself walking in the footsteps of Christ in the book. It's interesting that looking um, at us and then around us, it's very difficult to ignore the fact that most Christians still seem to look at the glory of God in a mirror as dimly as the spoon-like mirror uh, the Corinthians were using 2,000 years ago. And let me suggest that that is happening because we are using a double standard when we look in the mirror of the scripture. We don't read the Bible in a way that would motivate us to repent. We don't read the Bible in a way that would lead to our transformation from inside to the outside. We don't read the Bible in such a way that we can say truly, indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. If we would read the example that Jesus left for us in a faithful manner, then every time we look in the mirror, we would see him and not us. I think for a moment about all the, the tribute acts in the world. We have millions of people who grow their hair and they, then they arrange it to be like Elvis Presley. Then they take his clothes and try to imitate his voice and then go before thousands of people who miss Elvis so dearly that they are dying to see who the best impersonator is. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, think about it. What do the impersonators see when they look in the mirror? Of course, they see themselves. And then when they appear before the crowds, what do the crowds see when they look at the impersonator? Of course, they won't see uh, the, the, the man who is unemployed with a beer belly, uh, a heavy smoker, a person who is depressed, a person who is having challenges, but they see Elvis. They see beyond who the person is. So how much more influential Christ should be in our lives? If people who claim to be Christian would try to be like Jesus even 10% more, then this world would not be as we know it today. What do you see when you look in the mirror? Do you actually see a sinner that has the assurance of salvation in Christ and, and is behaving in a Christ-like manner in every situation? See, we, we don't know how to read the Bible very often. Or we don't want to read it as we should. For example, when I read the story of 
the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus, what do I read there? Let me present to you um, two ways of reading that episode, that moment when the rich young ruler comes to Jesus to ask for um, tips to inherit eternal life. The first way of reading it, let, let's call it the first scenario. A young rich ruler comes to Jesus to ask a question. He, he starts by complimenting Jesus. Uh, Luke 18, 18 and Mark 10, 7 tell us that he started his speech with good teacher, which determined Jesus to give him a reply that set a barrier between them. Jesus had to suggest to the man to reconsider his opinion of him because Jesus is not the, uh, one of the other teachers in Israel who, who would feel uh, maybe flattered when called good. Instead, Jesus is saying to this man that uh, only God is good. But the question of the young man did not stop after the sly adjective he used. But he continues with the question, what can I do to inherit eternal life? He identified the fact that Jesus has a key that no one else holds. So he wants to have it as well. He is not necessarily interested in what uh, Jesus has to say about other topics, because all he wants to know is how to inherit eternal life. He started his question in the way that he had, because he was thinking that Jesus will not tell him uh, straight away. For, for certain, this man was even prepared to offer money as a reward for that key. But he always wanted to try to use words to get it for free first. But instead of giving him the key, instead of telling him how he can inherit eternal life, um, Jesus teaches him a lesson. And we all appreciate all the situations when Jesus puts someone we dislike in the rightful place. We appreciate the situations when Jesus tells the Pharisees off. We appreciate the situations when Jesus tells even his disciples off. We always appreciate it when Jesus tells someone we don't like off. And that's the first way of reading the passage. But there's a second way of reading it. The second scenario. A rich young ruler came to Jesus to ask a question that uh, troubles me as well every day. What can I do to inherit eternal life? I go to church. I try to read the scripture as often as I can. I study the quarterly. I pray. I sing. Even when I'm at work, um, I give money to the poor. I pay my tithe. But I still feel that that is not enough. I feel that I'm not complete. There are so many voices around me telling me that I should do this or I should do that. And, 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 and oh, Lord, I'm so confused that I don't feel I will, etern I will inherit eternal life. Oh, if Jesus could just tell me what else I have to do from the list of criteria for eternal life. He told the young rich ruler to leave everything and follow him. Am I doing this? Am I following Jesus? That's the second way of reading that passage. Do you notice the difference between the two ways of reading the same passage? In the first scenario, in the first way of reading it, I am completely disconnected from the text, just as if I was reading Romeo and Juliet, and I was writing an essay on the attitude of Juliet or the attitude of Romeo in relationship uh, to their families. I, I can criticize the young rich ruler. I can applaud Jesus for his chasing away of those who are not worthy of following him. Then I will continue to tell myself that I am a true follower. And just like the Pharisee in the parable, I would thank God that I'm not like one of the other lowlifes in this world. But the second way of reading it is personal. I'm no longer interested in the gossip of the story. I'm sure you never looked at it this way, but it's true. Think about it. Uh, if we were witnessing that moment, it wouldn't have been the kind of story that you would tell your friends to belittle the little man who walked away from Jesus and have a good laugh over his weakness. It would be one of those stories that you could, uh, you would look forward to call someone and tell them, oh, look what happened today. I need to tell you, you're going to have such a laugh. 
And that's gossip. But if I read the Bible in order to extract the principles that are still relevant for my life today, I will leave the gossip aside and will look hard for the aspects of the story that speak about me, that speak about my life, that speak about my worries, that speak about my concerns, that speak about my doubts, that speak about my pain, that speak about my relationship with my Lord and Savior. How do I read the Bible passages? Are they bearing any message for me personally, or are they always only for others? Are, are the messages of, of repentance, of change, all the appeals from God for the men and women of the Bible, uh, are they for the people in history or for me personally as well? You see, if we understand the parable, uh, the, the metaphor that Paul is using with the mirror, we will also understand that if I don't look in the mirror in the right way, I will never be able to have Jesus Christ reflected in me. The way we look in the mirror, the way we read the word of God, and the way we interpret the word of God, the way we regard ourselves and others around us, the way we understand who God is, who Jesus Christ is, who the Holy Spirit is, and what everything uh, me is, what everyone around me is doing. If I don't get that right, I will not be able to be transformed by the word of God. And you see, because the concept of the mirror, uh, th this metaphor uh, was so important Paul is not the only one using it. He's not the only one to use this mirror to describe the relationship with God. I would like us to look at the parable that we find in the epistle of James in chapter 1. Maybe you, you haven't looked at um, this passage, uh, these verses as being a parable before. But the truth is that it's a parable that is essential for our daily life. So the, pas the passage is, again, our scripture reading, James 1, verses 22 to 26. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Do, do you see again the concept of the mirror? Uh, the apostles try to emphasize the importance of our transformation in, in such a way that we are reflecting God's character, both when we are with others, when we are in the presence of others, but also when we are by ourselves and we don't have anything to prove to anyone. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter how many verses we know by heart. It doesn't matter how many interpretations of the prophecies we know. It doesn't matter how many years we've been to church every single week. It doesn't matter how much money we've donated to the church. It, it certainly doesn't matter how many spiritual conversations we had with those around us in which they were mesmerized by our knowledge. What is most important is that God is seen in the way we fulfill everything that we have read. So allow me to call this parable the parable of the mirror. And the essential question that comes out of this passage is, why do I read the Bible? What is my purpose when I read the Bible? Is it just to inspect the mirror and leave? Or is it to look at my reflection in the mirror? When we go out of the house in the morning or at noon or in the afternoon, um, depending on, on what time you, 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 you wake up, um, we, we look in the mirror. And, and we can look in, in a mirror for two reasons. We can either look to admire how good looking we are, how nice our clothes are, how nice we put the makeup um, this morning, 
in this case, we, we don't really need the mirror because we live under the impression that we are already perfect. Even if we look at our reflection in a mirror spoon, in, 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 a, in a wooden spoon, sorry. In, in this situation, if we just look in the mirror to confirm what we already believed about ourselves, we are just like the Pharisees, the, the Pharisees in the times of Jesus. We are convinced that we don't need to change anything because we are already perfect, whatever others may think. They have a problem, not us. You remember in Snow White, where uh, the stepmother would look in the mirror to be told every time that she is the most beautiful? And whenever someone else was, was more beautiful than her, she tries to get rid of them because she was just looking for confirmation. She wanted the mirror to confirm what she already believed about herself. And in the same way, we can look in the mirror sometimes, in our, in our physical mirror, just to get confirmation of the fact that we already believe we are good enough. And then we go. And in this situation, the mirror is inefficient. Just like I said, we, we don't even need it anymore. We are okay without it, even though we keep it in the house somewhere where it can be seen. But there is another possible reason for looking in the mirror before we go out of the house. We can look in the mirror to see what is wrong with the way we look in order to analyze every inch of our face, to look at our hair, to, to make our hair right, to make our face right, to put our clothes on, okay, to arrange our tie in the right way, to aim to perfection, so that the moment we come out of the house, we are not full of blemishes and we are not full of spots, that our clothes are iron. There is this second way of looking in the mirror to learn what is wrong so that we can put it right. Look at the passage in James 1. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Uh, let's, let's try and make this parable even clearer. The words James is using in verses 22 to 24 in, in Greek uh, give an even better understanding of the parable that we are reading in our translations. First of all, we have a man who observes his face in a mirror, and after he observes, he goes away. The word in Greek actually refers to someone who discerns or, or carefully considers what he sees in the mirror. So it's not just a simple uh, looking in the mirror and then bye-bye. Uh, the man looks in the mirror a lot. Uh, he looks uh, at all the traits that he sees in the mirror. He identifies any spot on his face, any scar, and perceives them as being something bad. Then the second part of the passage says that he looked in the mirror and then he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Uh, to say that he forgets is, is, is a bit ambiguous. When you look in the mirror and, and you have clearly analyzed your defect and you, you have seen that there is something wrong with your face, there is something wrong with your hair, you can't just walk away, go through the door and forget about it. If, if you see a big scar on your face and you walk on the street, the only thing you can think about is how everyone else sees that. You can't simply forget what you've seen unless you have looked at the same defect for a long time and now you are so used to it that you don't consider it as being something bad anymore. But Greek helps us once again to uh, bring light over this parable. And, and the words used here that were translated as, as forget is actually used more frequently as neglect or ignores. So, so look at, at the parable from, from this new point of view. Be doers of the word 
and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who carefully considers his natural face in a mirror. He carefully considers himself, goes away, and immediately neglects what kind of man he was. You see, James is actually talking about people who read in the Bible about what is right and what is wrong, about people who read in the Bible about what is not okay, what is not in line with God's will in their lives, and then they go away and they pretend they haven't read it. It's about people who are reading the scriptures, people who are reading the word of God, and instead of being transformed, instead of allowing God to clean them up, Instead of allowing God to bring them back to the right path, they tell themselves they are okay. They look in the mirror and they immediately leave, immediately go away and ignore what they have read. What do you see when you look in the mirror? But even more importantly, maybe, what do you do? with what you see in the mirror. Jesus once went to the temple in Jerusalem. And as he was approaching the temple, his face was saddened by the sight of things happening around the temple. Uh, he, he concluded that the temple of God in Jerusalem has become a marketplace where people lost all traces of spirituality, where they were simply fulfilling some rituals and were coming to the temple to the sacrifice without any effort to bring their best offering. And seeing the distance between uh, the people and God, uh, business people came there with animals that were uh, on sale for atrocious prices. And in association with the priests and the Levites, they were selling their merchandise just a few feet away from the altar. As we know, Jesus goes there and he turns the tables of the merchants and, and he frees the animals that were being sold there and he ends his actions with the following words my house is a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves and ever since that episode we use this example as an application as to how bad the state the temple in jerusalem was in jesus times but once again maybe we don't read the bible properly we, we overlook the most important aspect of the text because we just inspect the mirror and don't look at our image in the mirror. What is a thief living in a den of thieves? Uh, cons consider this for a moment. Think about this. What is a thief in a den of thieves? What does a thief in the middle of other thieves in a den represent? Well, it's someone who committed a crime, doesn't repent for his actions, so now he has to hide in order not to get caught. A thief who is in a den of thieves is the thief who knows that he's done wrong, who knows that he has to suffer the consequences for what he's done, but he's running away and he's hiding, thinking that he can get away with it. You see, if we are in God's church and we are not people changed by the Holy Spirit and we don't repent for our sins and we are not transformed by God, are we not in a den of thieves as well instead of being in the house of God? If the children of God know that repentance is key, that repentance is paramount, to doing God's will. And we know, again, what is right and what is wrong. We know the Bible. We know what God wants from us. But still, we don't repent and we don't change. Aren't we just thieves in a den of thieves? If I look in the mirror and, and, and I can see that my life is full of sin, and I'm disappointing God when I break his commandments, and I don't correct myself, am I not a thief as well? 
all how much we try to discuss and see who knows more and who knows better and who has read more in the book and who can interpret the mirror better. But we don't realize that we are missing the point most of the times. Jesus is telling us to take our cross and uh, follow him every day. And the secret here is that if we take our cross, the only way we can go is uphill where Jesus was crucified. That's where we are being crucified with Christ as well, just like Paul puts it. That's where our transformation takes place with sacrifice every day. When we come before God, then we admit that what we deserve, our pay, our consequences, they're all represented by death. But because we have Jesus next to us, instead of punishing us, as a consequence for our sins, we are told that we can be in heaven. How wonderful it is to live the word of God. Look in the mirror of the scripture. Don't close your Bible and ignore the appeal from God to change your life. Do it. Allow yourself to be transformed by the Holy Spirit and then look in the mirror to see the power of the Holy Spirit transforming you. And as we go about our lives every day, may we indeed take our cross and walk with Jesus. May we indeed reach that point where we are crucified with Christ so that when we are with others and when we are by ourselves, Christ would be seen in our lives. And I pray that this afternoon, all our lives will be filled by the Spirit and transformed. May we use the Word of God in the right way. May we use the mirror of the Word in the right way. And then when Christ will finally be seen in our lives, when Christ will finally be the reflection in our, in our mirror, then we will be happy. Then we will be blessed. Then we will be a blessing for others. And then we will be able to wait for our Lord and Savior to come with the angels and call us home. May God bless you all. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, this afternoon, on this holy Sabbath day, we come before you once again, Lord, to thank you for the way in which you have revealed to us everything that you want from us, for the way in which you have revealed yourself in nature, in our lives, and most importantly, in your word, Lord. We thank you for the many, many hints that you have given us throughout our lives, at every step of the way, Lord, to encourage us to allow ourselves to be transformed, to encourage us that it is possible, to encourage us that that is what you want from us, Lord, to encourage us that this is how we will find happiness, that this is how we will finally understand what we are reading in the Word. So please, Lord, as we are coming before you today, I beg of you, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to give us the wisdom that we need to understand the mirror, to understand the word, to understand what transformation means and to allow transformation to happen in our lives. Lord, we want to see that day when Jesus Christ will come back to call us home, to call us to join him forever, to be with our God, to be with our creator, to be with our savior. So, Lord, we want to be prepared for that day. Do not allow us to leave this place, to leave your word and ignore what we have read, but allow us to be closer and closer every day to reflecting Jesus in and through our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.